Welcome to the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum. The ISF Podcast is hosted by ISF CEO Steve Durbin, and every episode he brings listeners features timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm producer Tavia Gilbert. This is the second in a two-part conversation with Dr. Andrea Matwishin, Penn State University Professor of Law. Andrea's work is at the intersection of technology design, innovation policy, and law. Today, she and Steve talk about regulating emerging technologies and the questions tech innovators need to start asking as we move into a new era of cyber. Andrea gives us a helpful look back at precedents in history, Andrea also offers historical precedent in the hopes that these precedents will help us navigate what can feel like unprecedented times. Let's look now at emerging technologies. So how do you see the role of legal frameworks evolving to address some of the challenges posed by emerging technologies? And I suppose I'm thinking particularly here of artificial intelligence when it comes to the field of information security. What's your take on that? So the attacks are effective already. Adversarial methodologies for manipulating large language models and other, air quotes, AI systems have been well known and continue to become more sophisticated. You know, for me, and maybe it's because there have been so many hype cycles that have come and gone in the 20 years that I've been (laughs) that I've been practicing law and teaching, which it's a scary realization for me that I've been doing this that long. Um, (laughs) It all comes down to those three elements that I articulated in my previous comment to you, which is that when we look at the approaches in law and policy to these new technologies, we always come back to three core elements, the context of deployment and use, the harm, the nature of the harm and its severity, and what kind of harm is possible. Um, So, for example, loss of life is a very serious harm that money does not fully remedy. Those are, Mm -hmm. when someone loses their life as a result of a technology, that was someone's family member. And the impact is not something that money can fully compensate. Um, Though, of course, in tort law, we do you put monetary values on life? But particularly when some of those lives may be in the global south, there's a problematic legal history in those valuation calculations, but I digress. The third element is the intent. So the context, the harm, and the intent. Chi, if you will, C-H-I. And so the intent goes to what the the various participants in that technology ecosystem knew or should have known at the time that the products or services were being offered to the public or were available globally. And when we look at those three elements, we start to think through coordinated, internationally harmonized regulatory frameworks that help to identify which kinds of failures of care are the most problematic because of their impact on the lives of humans. So I think it's been tempting for some parts of technology business to disconnect the things that they are building from the inquiry as to whether they are advancing the betterment of human life and the future. And for better or worse, I've been reengaging with science fiction stories. Mm-hmm. And what I have become increasingly concerned with is that we are dodging the big conversation, which is what is the society, what is the world that we want to build? There's no consensus on what a utopia looks like. And so anyone selling a vision of utopia needs to tell us why that that vision in all its idiosyncrasy is the right one. But what science fiction teaches us is that there are many, many different flavors of dystopias. And those dystopias evolve in different ways, and they have different costs associated with them. And one person's utopia may be another person's dystopia. 
So having the conversations around not just building for the sake of building, but asking why we're building. Hannah Arendt cautioned us to think what we are doing. There's another strand of Hannah Arendt's work that I'm engaging with in an article called Exploit Machina around this notion of cybernation, which was a popular term in the 1960s and and late 50s, perhaps, as the conversations around Sputnik and the space race were being evolved. And what cybernation in, in a rent scholarship means is this risk of a disconnection between the builders of technologies and the broader goals of society. Arendt viewed technology as simultaneously building something, but also potentially harming some of the democratic structures upon which we rely. And she cautioned against hyper-quantification, she called it mathematization, uh, hyper-quantification of basically humans, human labor, human outputs in ways that increased this sense of alienation between those who build the technologies and the people who use them slash are subject to them. And she was somewhat prescient, I think, in the way that she framed this. And reading her work really stoked my sense of urgency in talking through with the builders of these next generation technologies of what the point is. What is your end goal? What is the vision of a better world that you believe your technology is contributing toward? And that vision of a better world, I think, should be on the table so that we can debate whether that is, in fact, a better world. Because my sense is that my vision for what that better world is that I'd like to grow old in is not necessarily aligned with the vision that some of the builders of today's technologies are seeking to put out into the world. And we are at the point where building things just because we can and unleashing them to be beta tested in real time on unsuspecting consumers with low degrees of technological proficiency in some case, that is, I think, not the model of deployment and trust that we want to be employing. An untrustworthy technology released into a world where most people aren't hackers and can't defend themselves is not a constructive step of progress, but potentially a choice to harm. And that's where those three variables of context, harm, and intent I think need to be our touchstones for guiding regulatory approaches, but also for a type of meta threat modeling that should happen inside companies and for technology creators as they are designing and planning their deployment, shipping, and maintenance models for their own products. And I don't think those conversations are robustly happening. I think we're still suffering in some corners of the tech economy from over-enthusiasm and an interest in moving fast and breaking things. And I think we are past the moving fast and breaking things era. This needs to be the era of building wisely and being responsible for what you put out in the world. It's a really big challenge though, isn't it? Because if you look at the sheer clout that say big tech has, if you look at the way that the technology industry has evolved from a country standpoint, so let's assume that we are country ABC, doesn't really matter which one it is, and we have a regulatory environment that is in line with what you've just been suggesting. There may be some listening to this who think, well, that's very constraining. So I'll go and set up my company in a different part of the world that doesn't have such constraining regulation, where I have this ability to, to unleash my product into the market. And that, for me, is the real dilemma that we're facing here. Because, you know, on the one hand, we want to continue to encourage entrepreneurs, innovation. Yes, of course, we can't, you know, stop technology evolving. But at the same time, somehow, 
and I don't have an answer to this, somehow we need to bring back a sense of responsibility, which to your point is how do we look, look forward to the implications? A good example would be encryption, for instance. So if we look at the stance that Apple has taken with regard to its ability to actually see what people are doing within its environment, if we look at the stance that, say, WhatsApp has been taking. Now, some of those things are coming up against banging heads with regulators, particularly in the UK, for instance, around the fact that they have to be able to disclose. And the response is, well, we can't disclose because the product was never designed that way and we can't retrofit it. So that's an example of how the cynic would say, Big tech avoided the problem by creating something that they couldn't be forced to police. On the other hand, some might say, well, you know, is this really the role of the regulator to prevent businesses rolling out products? So there's a huge dilemma around that. And I suppose the question has to be as to whether or not our regulatory, our legal frameworks today are fit for purpose in such a cyber enabled world. And I guess I would say no. What's your take? Well, as as you know, I think that we do need in the United States context one streamlining, coordinating new regulator to have the gaps filled and to ensure that things are working. But I would also say that in addition to that troller proposal, I think we in tech sometimes fail to learn from history and we like to view things as exceptional and extraordinary and entirely novel, when in reality, some of what we're building and the problems that we're facing definitely have corollaries in past eras of history. So one story that I would share that perhaps addresses some of the concerns that um, you're voicing is the story of how the United States addressed spectacular engineering failures in the late 1920s. Um, Many people may be familiar with the Hoover Dam in Nevada, which was an engineering marvel at the time, but fewer people are familiar with the St. Francis Dam, which is one of the greatest tragedies of engineering that happened shortly prior. So the St. Francis Dam was a project that was heavily controlled and managed by one person whose name was William Mulholland. And he had a particular vision for this dam. He lacked formal engineering training. Uh, He was prone to disregard advice on the ways that the dam should be built. And then the dam's capabilities were expanded beyond what the original specifications had called for, resulting in an untenable situation in the long term. As cracks started to appear in the dam, the reports were disregarded. Patching did not happen. Mulholland insisted that people were catastrophizing and that the dam was fine. The dam ultimately collapsed in almost its entirety. Reports place the deaths at upwards of 500 people, with others missing, with millions of dollars of damage. Various commissions resulted, litigation resulted. The city of Los Angeles paid out approximately $5,000 per lost life, which goes back to that point of what is the value of a human Mm -hmm. life and how we calculate that, which is a fraught inquiry. And ultimately, because the Hoover Dam was already sort of in the works quietly in congressional conversation, there was a crisis of confidence with respect to the profession of engineering. Because when you have such a large loss of life, nobody wants a disaster waiting to happen in their backyard or potentially impacting their community. So what happened was twofold. The first was an embracing and the creation of a liability regime around these sorts of failures. The second was a move by the engineering 
community to organize around core principles, ethical principles of the way that they would perform their services and practice their profession. And this is how we came to the first sets of engineering codes through this process. And so in a rather short time frame, the profession of engineering, the legal end of liability for building, and the faith of the public in engineered products of such grand scale was functionally transformed, and the resulting structure of the Hoover Dam demonstrated a completely different way of building. So whereas the St. Francis Dam had been the work primarily of a single person with a grand vision that was imposed downward, the Hoover Dam was a heavily peer-reviewed collaborative enterprise with validation checks at every point, going to your point about the need to do various forms of audit and threat assessment and penetration testing, et cetera. So the Hoover Dam had a completely different building process incorporated with a different engineering profession that was a better version of itself. And it stands to this day, never having collapsed. And that's, I think, the moment that we are in for security. I think we need to choose to move forward toward a Hoover Dam model and move away from a St. Francis Dam model. And we've done that successfully in that context. Another context where we had a pivotal moment in U.S. history was in the 1960s when there was a pollution problem that, uh, although certainly our environmental situation is not ideal now, but we had a pollution problem where major rivers were catching on fire. There was a river in Ohio called the Cuyahoga River, which caught on fire many times. And it got us to the point where coalitions in society came together and President Nixon, so not exactly known as a president who was interested in maximally flexible rights-enhancing liberal proposals, uh, liberal in the, in the U.S. sense, he pushed through the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S., and a set of environmental laws, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Superfund Law, which have one of the most robust legal regimes and most aggressive liability regimes in order to ensure that the waterways, which were critical infrastructure functionally, could become usable again for both commerce and for citizens. And indeed, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio now has fish again. People can use it for sporting things. And so it took 20 plus years, but that creation of an agency and the imposition of a legal liability regime, again, helped to ensure that the direction was corrected toward one that benefited both the people who lived on the Cuyahoga River and the industry that relied upon it. And I think that is another important example. Technology history is full of these stories, and I think we don't adequately engage with the lessons that we can glean from the conduct and work of the generations that came before us. And certainly these examples that you've been giving, I think hopefully will will give food for thought to our listeners because we are moving into certainly some uh, potentially highly problematic areas with some of the emerging technologies that we're talking about and the way that they are potentially being rolled out. Because regulation, as we know, is always going to be playing catch up. It is never going to be ahead of of the game. So, Andrea, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to me today on the podcast and for for sharing such interesting and different perspectives on the legal and regulatory aspects that we'll be facing. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thanks to today's guest, Dr. Andrea Matwishan. We'll be back with a new episode next week. In the meantime, if you would take 10 seconds to pull up this podcast on whatever device you're listening, give us a five-star rating and write a quick review, we'd be grateful.
You can also listen to the ISF Analyst Insight podcast, which goes in depth on the hottest topics in information security. In every episode, ISF analysts hand select active security professionals from ISF member organizations to discuss how the implementation of ISF research is uniquely applied to their real world context. We hope you'll listen, and of course, we'll put a link to that show in our show notes. If there's a topic or question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find our catalog of past video and podcast episodes, as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with senior producer Katie Flood, mix and master by Kayla Elrod, music by Alexander Filipiak. Thanks for listening.